Susan is um, currently uh, at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. She's actually the director of the Einstein Forum in Potsdam. And her new book that she's working on is Moral Clarity, a guide for grown-up idealists, which is described as a defense, I hope this is correct, a defense of the moral language of the Enlightenment as a foundation for a liberal worldview robust enough to meet contemporary challenges. Thank you, Roger. You're welcome. All completely correct. I, um, I did want to say a couple of words about the discussion yesterday. And uh, to some extent today, uh, before I go into the two questions that Roger asked me to answer, having to do with morality without religion or with religion, or um, what one does instead or in addition, I cannot help but feel a real sense of foreboding in this conference that I didn't expect to find, uh, although I've learned quite a lot, one of the most shocking statements that I've heard in the last couple of days was that of uh, Steven Weinberg, that the uh, crazy old aunt of religion is on her last legs and um, we might miss her when she goes. Now, for an extremely distinguished scientist um, who values uh, statements based on evidence and not on wishful thinking, um, I had to wonder uh, where he was getting his uh, information because although this might have been a statement you would make 25 years ago, it's certainly not a statement that makes any sense now um, when we all know the rise in religion and not just in uh, religious participation but fundamentalist religion is the most interesting and surprising fact of the last, oh, let's say, decade at the least. Now, it seems to me we have two choices. We can pull up the barricades, um, see ourselves as the uh, Irish monks in the 6th century holding out the bits of treasures of civilization and wisdom in front of the barbarians and occasionally shout beyond the walls as to, you know, uh, for the couple of people that might still be around to listen. Or we can do something quite different, which is to ask ourselves, what it is that they're seeing that we're not, what it is that's missing in our culture that uh, they're getting from somewhere else. This is not simply a tactical consideration, although it is also a tactical consideration. Um, conferences like these and with this sort of subject are called because I think there's a perceived sense of crisis and it's an international one. But I'm a bit reminded here of a conference on similar issues that was called uh, about 10 days before the 2004 election in New York City. I know Richard Dawkins was there, uh, nobody else in this, uh, were you there? Sorry, I forgot. Um, and the conference was titled Us Versus Them. Now there's the sort of interesting spectacle of the idea that a bunch of intellectuals sitting in New York could somehow in a last minute action influence the tide of the election that everybody was frightened to, but we all came from various places and were committed to trying to do so. But as I sat there watching people preaching to the converted with rather uh, a lack of understanding of what was going on in the rest of the world, I uh, walked out and said, uh, boy, if this is us, they're going to win. <laughs> so it's partly a tactical question, but I don't believe that we can change our tactics unless we genuinely change our attitudes. Richard Dawkins is staring skeptically. Yes, I do mean, no, he does not say, I haven't said anything that will offend you yet, but, um, because I'm about to, <laughs> namely, um, I do think that what's going on in the world needs to be treated with at least the respect uh, that's necessary in order to get some more understanding, and that is what I'm trying to do in the book that uh, I'm currently working on. Um, so in order to answer the first question Roger asked, uh, can we be good without God, uh, I want to start with a biblical reference, enough to uh, provoke uh, some of you, I'm sure, and not just any old biblical reference, but uh, one from a place dear to the hearts of fundamentalists, namely the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. 
Uh, just about everybody knows that the cities were destroyed completely. Lot's wife turned into a pillar of salt for even looking at them backwards. The sin that uh, did them in, by the way, is uh, something you don't need to be a believer to abhor. We're not talking about fornication or multiple orgies here, but about the sodomites' demand to drag out and gang rape two strange visitors to whom Lot gave shelter. The strangers turned out to be angels, which is the sodomites' undoing, but their transgressions were pretty severe, even if you believe neither in God or the ancient rites of the guests. Now, what fundamentalists rarely tell you is what happens when Abraham goes to these dens of iniquity or stands before them and has his finest hour. God reveals his plan to annihilate the two cities, and Abraham speaks up. What if there are 50 innocent people among the sinners? The judge of all the earth, he says, cannot act so unjustly as to let the innocent and guilty suffer alike. Well, the judge of all the earth agrees. If there are 50 righteous people in Sodom, he will leave the city alone. And then Abraham answers, well, surely the Lord isn't a pedant, right? Uh, what if the number turns out to be smaller? Would he destroy the whole city for a lack of a mere five? Uh, <clears throat> The answer is obvious. The Lord will save Sodom if uh, there are 45 righteous people in it. And uh, Abraham quits after bargaining God down to 10. Two things about his behavior stir hearts like mine. Uh, one is its resolute universalism. Abraham's concern for the innocence of Sodom has nothing to do with kinship or tribalism. It's concern for innocence everywhere. The other is Abraham's resoluteness, period. In his concern for the innocent, he's prepared to take risks, for the texts make it perfectly clear that Abraham is scared. His words are neither proud nor wheedling, but the plea of a servant towards a master who could extinguish him with a glance. Here I venture to speak to my Lord, I, am, I who am but dust and ashes, is what he says when he gets the negotiation going. Oh, let the Lord not be angry if I go on, is what precedes the line that bargains down to 30. Now, it's striking that Abraham seems more frightened when he pleads for the unknown sodomites than when he prepares to follow the Lord's command to kill his own son. This text is likely to be more familiar, and the binding of Isaac is the thing that sustains fundamentalists of every color. When a voice calls you to take your son, your only son whom you love, and journey to a distant height which will be indicated later, you saddle up your ass and do it, secure in the faith that the Lord will solve whatever problems arise on the way. An hour-long Jewish, Christian, and Muslim theologian struggle to find multiple meanings in this text. The dominant seems to be this one. Abraham's unquestioning willingness to heed God's command to sacrifice the thing he loved most is what qualified him to become the father of what are called still the Abrahamic faiths. Kant's comment on the passage, by the way, was unequivocal. Uh, Abraham should have reflected and considered that whoever could ask him to do that can't be God. Now, I have no qualms about being partisan. The Abraham who risks God's wrath to argue for the lives of unknown innocents is the kind of man who would face down an unjust tyrant anywhere. He's deeply human in the best of all senses, and neither his fear nor his frailty stands in the way of his own reason. He's reverent, but not deferential, for his faith is based on his moral backbone, not the other way around. He is, in short, what I like to call an enlightenment hero. As Kierkegaard taught us, the Abraham who takes his son to Mount Moriah left ethics and enlightenment behind. But I'd be cheating if I tried to argue that the Abraham at Sodom and Gomorrah was the genuine or the more central one. I bring these two stories up to show that the Old Testament itself is magnificently equivocal. Both stories are part of our repertoire anchored very firmly in the first book of the Bible on which so many others in all three faiths depend. And though religious thinkers will fight fiercely to show its standpoint to be the one religion really sanctions, each religion has signposts po pointing both ways. On the one hand, towards a fundamentalist authoritarian strain that insists if you want to be faithful, you have to crucify your intellect, that is, to believe just because your belief is absurd, 
And on the other hand, these, each of the three Western religions has a rationalist tradition which begins from the recognition that no law applies itself ever. Supposing you take revelation as authoritative, it still has to be interpreted. And most of what we know today as scholarship began in the attempt to figure out how law, which meant religious law at the time, applies to the world. So far from viewing our capacity to reason as threatening our capacity to obey God, this tradition sees thinking as its very fulfillment. Um, there are actually some wonderful Jewish parables which show God laughing with pleasure as uh, human beings defeat him with a particularly good argument. Um, that is, um, God would rather be impressed than right on certain Jewish rationalist traditions. So, if reason is God's gift, he meant us to use it even against him if he turns out to be wrong or hasty. On this tradition, our ability to make sense of the world, whether with science or through the right moral actions, is just one more proof of God's goodness. Now, remembering these facts should stop us from dividing the world along religious and secular lines. I can't repeat this often enough. Um, the question is not whether religion and science are compatible, but this is not the interesting divide. Um, I don't want to uh, um, go into this uh, for too much time, but if you're uh, curious about that, think about whether postmodernism and natural science are compatible. Um, I, you know, whether they rest on the same notions of truth or evidence, um, I think the answer is really very clearly no. For many rationalist religious th uh, thinkers, uh, there's more in common with secular social democrats than with fellow believers. And again, um, I think many a fideist is much closer to a postmodern nihilist than either wants to admit. Far less important than your belief uh, whether God exists is what you think your belief entails. Does it direct your behavior by rules and commandments that are set out before you, or does it require you to think them through yourself? Does it require you to try to make sense of the world, or does it give up on sense itself? And I think these are the crucial distinctions, not whether you add belief in a God to them. So even for those who believe it, biblical authority doesn't help much. They have to decide how the book should be read, and any serious reading of it will raise the question, are things good because God loves them, or does God love them because they're good? And, uh, they're good, and as Steve pointed out, uh, readers of Plato will remember, this isn't even a question that's uh, confined to monotheism. All right. Um, Socrates was executed for alleged impiety. His crime wasn't atheism. He really did believe in the local gods. But for insisting that reason take priority over them. Goodness isn't arbitrary. Things must be good in themselves, which is what makes the gods love them. The gods' choice cannot make something good that's evil, even if they happen to be gods. Now, for fundamentalists, this sort of view not only expresses pride, but it's the first step down a path which God himself, if subject to any limits, including the limits of reason, is no longer God, hence no longer necessary. There are very interesting arguments about this. I mean, uh, the one thing I really do have to emphasize, one hears some rather, um, some of the objections to religious thinking uh, that I've heard during this conference really does uh, proceed on the assumption that there haven't been religious thinkers. Um, and uh, honestly, there have been. Um, and they think about these things. And even if you don't believe in the existential claims that are being made, it's really interesting material. Um, so, um, but I don't want to get into theological debates right now. I bring these stories up to show that whatever the tradition, there are deep sources for rejecting the question, do we need religion to maintain ethics? Because the answer is a resounding no. 